Then they've got two activated hand grenades in my hand, which I didn't know what it means, activated or anything. It says, you hold this tight, and if you let it go, you'll blow yourself and you'll blow the rest of your family. When did you start to notice that things were beginning to change in Bosnia? I came to school and it was in May, two weeks prior to the war starting in Kozarat. I came to school and I've seen my teacher uh, with a full uniform and Kalashnikov on the desk pointing at me. So I said to the teacher, so what, what, why are you wearing a uniform? And why is the gun pointed at me? And he says, are you scared? Because I'm a Serb. Are you scared I'm going to kill you? And everything was thrown at me. And I was only 13. I said, oh, I don't know that you're a Serb. I thought we were all the same. Uh, around the area where we were, a lot of houses were getting destroyed. It felt like, for some reasons, you didn't reach our village yet. Um, and we'd been told... The minute when we've been told um, the troops, the ground troops are entering the village, I think that's when the horror started. That particular morning, it was a sunny morning, and um, all I can hear is the, the, the mil military van coming, and my mum run to me, and then my father came, he says, look, you might be questioned, don't say nothing. It's like, whoa. <sighs> What's this? What if these guys threaten to kill me? He said, you know, whatever they say to you, even if they have to kill you, you don't say nothing. And that stuck in my head. Before you know it, they, they've turned up. We were all outside of the house when um, there's a group of six of them. Just when they reached me, my father was next to him, my mum was on her side. My dad whispered to me, say, do not look at them in the eyes, because as they're looking, I started looking at them and says, do not look at them in the eyes. And that was the, the best advice I had from my father. <laughs> you know, I didn't know at the time, but I think it's, um, you become a witness and the, the chances are low of surviving. So you, you look at someone, you remember their face and they'd have to kill you because you become a witness that in the future you can recognise them. So avoiding an eye contact, it's bust. They um, strip me naked in front of 26 family members and uh, I was tortured. It started with, um, they put me on execution spot and they've asked me a simple question, do you know if anybody um, distributed the, the, the weapons to the people in the village for territorial army, I said, just raising my hands. Um, and they put me on an execution spot. He says, if you don't tell us, you'll have three chances, we'll shoot you. And um, all three chances, I, I kept quiet whilst dad was right in front of me. When they put me on execution spot, I was away from my mom and from my mom and the rest of the family. Only me and dad were, were taken behind the bushes, but they can hear me. They were literally around the corner. And my mom thought at this point when the first bullet went, they've, they've, they've killed me. And then they shot above my head and the second bullet and the third bullet, I think the soldier knocked the barrel, so he, he missed me. Then they've got two activated hand grenades in my hands, which I didn't know what it means, activated or anything. He says, you hold this tight, and if you let it go, you'll blow yourself and you'll blow the rest of your family. And I, and I, and I held this so tight that, like, my life depends on it. I, I wasn't sure if, if the pins were taken out or not, um, but I was convinced the pins were out. Um, all of this only by when the soldier took it off me, the concentration in his hands, um, 
the, they, they were activated hand grenades for, given to a 13 years old child. Then that wasn't enough. They started beating me with a buckle of a belt, the army buckle of a belt. Then they took a knife and they made crosses here, which is still a little bit, you can see here. And then I've got crosses on my chest, all with blood. Beating started with the, um, the rifle bot. Um, and it lasted for a couple hours. It was probably the, the, the longest couple hours in my in my life until I started gushing, the blood started coming out of my mouth and nose, they've stopped. Oh, I heard one soldier saying, we will come back to kill you. And I, I was lying down in a pond of blood. And what's interesting, the, the parents, the family members were scared to come near me for a very long time, you know, um, until until the, 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 the soldiers drove off. You, you mentioned um, an old school teacher who was a Serbian teacher. Is that the person who tortured you? Yeah. That's the person that came around with the rest of the soldiers. Can you explain to us about why he did those things to you? I don't know. I, I, I guess um, because he, he loved me so much and then he found out throughout the war that when the war kicked off that we were different and we were enemies. So all of a sudden if you were Serb and the other person is a Bosnian and the other person were Croat, you became an, an immediate enemy. What happened to you and your family after you experienced that first torture? The shelling in, in, in our village and around the villages stopped after a couple of weeks and then the troops went down so they were surrounding the villages, they were ethnically cleansing the whole area and they were putting us into concentration camps. So there was a Keratem concentration camp, there was a Manicha, there was Ternopoye. And um, we we fallen into the concentration camp called Ternopoye, which was my school and some of the guards were our teachers. How did you and your family um, end up fleeing the concentration camp? We got an auntie that lives in Croatia, so um, my dad um, found a way of getting us through his friend uh, to Croatia, where we found refuge only for a short period of time. In um, auntie's house in Croatia, first time I um, experienced the nightmares. So I um, had a soldier shouting, we'll come back to kill you. Then my dead family members are coming in front of me, calling him to join them. The real nightmares with sleeping patterns start affecting me, but we, you know, we just thought the child, my, my, my mom thought the child ha is having a bad dream about the war. Didn't know anything about mental problems or PTSD until we, we, we came to UK. Can you explain what it was like when you travelled to the UK? We, we came by coach, so two coaches were sent uh, from UK. Um, to collect those refugees. We, we stayed in Birmingham Central Mosque um, and, and that's where um, it was our, a refuge for time being until they found us housing. I remember the doctor turning up um, to the mosque. He straight away said to uh, my parents that um, I will suffer with, with, with a mental problem for the rest of my life. He'll never be a, a normal child. He'll never be able to follow education. He'll never be able to have a proper job. Or he'll never be able to have kids. And that really hit me hard. One day, the, the, the teacher, Mr. Thatka, spotted me. Um, a, one, a couple of boys were kicking my head in whilst I was on the floor. And um, they took me in and they said, what's going on? And, 
yeah, they've realised I don't even speak. And, and most of the time people say he doesn't speak because he doesn't speak English. But there's more to it. The school took a real interest. And um, one of the teachers said to me, how about you turning up to assembly and speaking in front of your year head? Um, and just saying a few things what had happened to me. And I felt, you know, uh, after the war, what I'd been through, um, it was probably the biggest challenge that I faced. It was the biggest challenge for me, uh, receiving that pain from the bullies, but going and talking, facing the bullies uh, and talking, it was a nightmare. Um, but I said, I owe something to the teachers. I must put a lot of effort. So it was a morning assembly, um, a Friday, end of the week, I always remember it, and uh, I said, uh, hi, a war problem, Bosnia, soldier, killed my family, I no like war, no weapon. <laughs> and I was looking at the sheet of paper that I wrote and I read all night and all day to get myself prepared and ready. I was so concentrating to get these words out, to pronounce them, because pronunciation was a nightmare. And uh, I looked around and, and um, every single person in that room, including teachers, were crying. <laughs> you know, you see a bullies that have done really bad things to me in school, as they do, they're crying, you know. So, so it's the first time I felt compassion. I felt the uh, somebody's listening, um, somebody's understanding me. Do you think 13-year-old you would have expected that you have got where you have now? Even today, I really felt that my family, uh, a brother and a sister, and mom and dad, been through so much. But having said that, they feel so proud of me now. I achieved so much, and I have my own family, I have my own kids, I have a boy and a girl, and I have my wife, a wonderful wife. And um, people ask me, we've been through that, and you've earned a bit of money, you've got stability. But I want to lead this world by, by giving a good example of being a good role model. So when people see me, they just see me as um, I, I, I do everything to demonstrate what it means to be good people, good citizens of this world, and to share this world with harmony and peace. In my little world, I want to bring the people together with our similarities rather than our small differences. And because of what happened in the school in Bosnia and how I was treated in the school in the UK, I wanted to become a teacher to teach the world. The normal teachers don't do those things what I have experienced. A pamphlet was once handed to me outside a clinic that said, women who have abortions are more likely to, sorry, are more likely to sexually abuse their children. And women are receiving this information, trying to access healthcare. 